Hi, I'm here today with Corbett Barr of Think Traffic, CorbettBarr.com, Expert Enough, um, Insanely Useful Media, which I love that name, so I had to bring that in here. All right. um, I don't know if you've de developed that site at all, but I love it. So um, thank you for coming today, spending some time with me. Thanks for having me on. Glad to be one of your uh, one of your first few male guests, as you said. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm going to have to have a triple play of all, all my guys in like one week or something. Um, but thank you very much. And, you know, I wanted to tell you that um, and tell the, the, the viewers as well that, you know, I discovered you, I think, a, maybe even just a, like more, a little more than a year ago. And it probably was through Laura Roeder. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, I was lurking a while, reading a lot. And then finally last December, I took one of your live classes that you had. And funny thing is that I was actually, I was on both of those I think there were two of them when I was in Maui on vacation. I thought it was okay. so funny that I'm like, okay, I'm on vacation, listening to Corbett, whatever. So, um, so anyways, I just want to thank you again. And today I was excited to ask you some questions about launching, um, blog, launches and yep. a whole other uh, array of questions in that area. Let's do it. I'm I'm uh, I'm prepared or okay. I'm not prepared, but I'll do <laughs> the best I can. How's that sound? And that sounds great. Um so the first thing I I always like to ask people is, you know, if you want to give a little background on your like on where you are right now in your business. I mean, people can go there, go to your, go to your sites, go to CorbettBar.com and really find out the story. But mm -hmm. like, where are you right now? Where's your business? Yeah. So I am, uh, I have been self-employed now for about six years. And, um, for the first half of that, the first three years, I did a traditional venture capital backed startup in San Francisco. So, yeah. you know, when people say startup, you know, they usually think of you have advisors and investors and an, an office and employees and all that kind of stuff. And and um, generally you're building a service online, some sort of software. And that's exactly what I did for three years or so. And um, in 2008, remember, the economy totally crashed and we were kind of caught in a situation where we couldn't easily raise enough money to keep the entire team together. We had to make a lot of hard decisions. And I had been sort of dissatisfied with the fact that even though I was an entrepreneur and I had this, you know, I, I created this world for myself because of having all of those different components, the advisors, the investors, the co-founder, the uh, office, the employees, all that kind of stuff. I ended up feeling like I actually had less freedom in that situation and, and far more responsibility than I had when I was an employee before. So, I, you know, I jumped into entrepreneurship because I knew that I wanted to control my own destiny um, and have just frankly more opportunities and more upside and a whole lot of different things. But I didn't really think hard about the lifestyle aspect of it and how I wanted to shape that world. You know, I just I just wanted I knew that you had to create something and put it out there and hopefully get customers and that sort of thing. But I didn't really think about how the pieces worked internally. So in 2008, I decided to leave the startup world. And we went on a sabbatical through Mexico, my wife and I for about six months just to sort of hit the reset button and really consider what we wanted. And um, I ended up starting a blog on that trip, and I ended up really pondering how I wanted my life and my career to fit together and what I wanted out of the two things. And um, we were on this trip, and we started meeting people who actually had sort of made that happen. These people weren't rich or retired, but they had somehow figured out ways to live in a foreign country for months every year. And so I just kind of started thinking about how could I do this in a way that makes these pieces fit together in a way that I'm actually loving what I do right now and there's no rush to like build something and sell it, you know, and, and try to hit a home run. Just really love what I do. And um, that journey really started with blogging and that was about three years ago. And, and um, since then I've started, you know, a half dozen or more different projects and sort of seen what worked. And I ended up really with this site, Think Traffic, that's, that's you know, doing the majority of the income for us at this point. But, um, you know, that's kind of where I've been. And, and now it's three years later. And right now I'm in San Francisco. And this is where I spend about six months out of the year. And the rest of the time we travel, my wife and I go back to Mexico every winter. And we live there for a few months in the winter. We went to Europe for a couple of months. Um, last year, I was just in Lake Tahoe for a few days. Um, and, you know, we just like to travel and work wherever. As long as there's an internet connection, then I can kind of set up shop, you know. Wow. Yeah, I'm, I am... I'm, I think I'm still in that phase of working, 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 and, and still thinking about the lifestyle aspect of it and really kind of coming out of that, like where, where, where that needs to be. So that's really, it's an interesting story of how you got, got to that point. 
Yeah, and, and it's not, not to say that I don't work hard because, you know, I think there's a bit of a misconception. People think, oh, I'm going to travel the world and start a business. And the fact is that, like, when you're traveling the world, it's pretty hard to focus enough and have enough time to put in to really get a business off the ground. So for me, um, travel is more about living in one particular place for a long time because I know that when I'm, you know, traveling, you know, in different places every week, I'm not going to get a whole lot of work done. So in the beginning, you know, we were in Mexico and, and um, I was able to really put roots down even though we were in a foreign country and get a lot of work done because it, it takes a, an incredible amount of effort to get a business off the ground. Then once it's up and running, now, you know, I can take more time and, and um, just say, you know what, the business is going to be in slow growth mode for the next couple of months while I'm traveling or something like that. But, um, you know, there are some sacrifices you have to make and it's not, it's not easy just because you can do it from anywhere. Yeah, definitely. I can, I can definitely say that, <laughs> see that. Um, well then, okay. So then that, that's usually my first kind of question that now let's just dig right into launches. And I'd love to know if you can share your, one of your first, like your very first launch stories, big, small, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. what was your first thing that you launched? Well, you know, um, obviously you launch a blog in some ways, but I think a lot of people, their first time out with a blog, there isn't really a launch event. It's more like, you know, you spend some time putting it together, then you just start writing and then you just hope that people are going to show up, you know, and there's not a plan for it. And so we can talk about that. But the other thing is, um, you know, if you're a business, you have to launch an offering. You have to have something that people can buy, a service or a product or whatever. And I see so many bloggers out there spending, uh, you know, month after month or sometimes year after year blogging and putting out free content and trying to build up their audience and their platform, which is all good, but they kind of miss that other component of what a business really is, which is what value are you trying to give to someone and how can they pay you for that value? You know, there yeah. has to be an offer there. So for me, um, it was kind of a big surprise. You know, I worked really hard on blogging for over a year before I created my first product. And um, when I launched that first product, it was a big surprise at how many people ended up buying it. And I wish that I'd done it sooner. And now <laughs> I, I, I talk to people over and over again who have been at it for a long time. And it's really easy to talk yourself out of creating that first product or that first service you know, for, for a long time. And um, I know so many people who end up being pleasantly surprised like I was that, holy crap, there are people out there who actually <laughs> for this thing that I created, you know. I know. It's um, it's something that I encourage people to do early, you know, much sooner than you think. And even even if you don't sell a whole lot of copies of whatever it is, or or get a whole lot of clients for your services, um, you're going to learn a lot along the way, and and it's just going to get better and better. And you really just have to get out there and and do it, you know. Yeah. Did you have any help at that point, or did you do it all yourself? Is that why it kind of like took you that you? Or I know maybe you took that that long to develop it because you wanted it to be maybe perfect or whatever but did you have someone to work with during that time or I think um, a couple of things so first of all I, I kind of played around I actually had um, I did some web development and some services for people for a while I also did some affiliate marketing where I launched a lot of different little niche sites and kind of played around with that mm -hmm. and I learned a lot from that but I also learned that it wasn't you know it wasn't what I wanted to do um, and also I sort of talked myself out of the first product for months and months, I you know I would start to work on it and then think, oh, nobody's going to want this. It's kind of a dumb idea. I should do something else. And you just kind of waste so much time whether or not this thing's going to be perfect. When if you just did it and got it out there, you would know the answer, and and then you would have this thing and you could move on. And if it works, great. If it doesn't, you know that's just kind of how it is. Um, so I didn't have any help at that point. It, it was just me. Um, I like I said, I spent a lot of time learning a lot of different things, and then. Um, what I did was basically I had learned how to create some little affiliate marketing sites and how to um, actually earn revenue from those. It wasn't anything earth shattering, but I realized that I had a breakthrough there and that there were other people learning or hoping to learn the same thing. And so I just put together a course basically teaching what I had learned. And, and for me now that's become a pattern. You know, it's like learn something, discover how to teach it, maybe work with a client or two and try to teach it one-on-one -on -one, and then package that up into a, a product and then sell it to you know dozens or hundreds of people. So it's, it's kind of a, a pattern that I've learned and, and that's another thing I encourage people to do is just to figure something out, learn how to do it well, teach a couple of people and then put it together a course or an ebook or something on it and, and sell to more people at a more affordable price, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely... That's definitely a strategy I like to employ too, because like 
you are you're testing it you're testing this offer you're kind of refining that idea as you go along with a person so it's it's a great great idea to do that you can look for something that is um, relatively fresh where there's not a whole lot of information out there on it already um, for example a friend of ours I don't know if you know Brett Kelly who mm-hmm. ever note essentials and a few years ago, and he was just a guy who liked the software known as Evernote. It's a productivity app that helps you take notes and you know collect pictures and files and all kinds of things. And he was really good at it. And he thought, you know, there's no good source of information out there, so I'm going to write an ebook about it. So he created this book. He didn't. He had a blog, but it wasn't like a major platform, and it wasn't about Evernote. And he launched this thing, and because there was so much demand out there and so few resources about it, he became the expert on Evernote. And he thousand copies of that ebook over the past yeah actually after you told me what it was i was like oh yeah i know that yeah yeah (laughs) so evernote you know a piece of software like that that nobody else knows um or like kickstarter like a platform that so many people want to use well but there's not like a lot of good you know information out there you could write an ebook on something like that or like on pinterest or you know whatever like a a new sexy new platform is that a lot of people haven't discovered you have an edge because you know nobody else is an expert already on that. So if you get started early, you can kind of become the expert on that. I think you know Laura um, Roder has done a good job with that with various social media platforms. She just early on learned that she could figure it out and teach other people and yeah. built an entire business on that. It's yeah, and, and that's what we do. That's what we do now, and that's that's why we changed to the social media marketer business platform because it allows us to like get out that training faster without creating these huge courses, but give people the training they need right away. Right, exactly. So, um, okay, well, that's that's interesting. I mean, I think most people do start with no help and getting the, you know, I think the product, like you were saying, like the product is like one piece of it and then the testing with a person, the real life human, I think is another component of it that, you know, helps to make sure that it's actually something that, help someone, you know, you obviously want to get results with that person. Um, and I recommend that people, a lot of times that they start with services, you know, yeah. actually help a client walk through something hands on because you learn so much from those initial clients that you work one on one with. Yeah. You know, uh, actually that's something that you even suggested to me on one of the calls. And honestly, I didn't even put anything up on my site and I just mentioned it to maybe a few people. And then all of a sudden people were calling me. I didn't even have to do anything. Then I felt bad that I didn't have anything up. So that was a, that's a whole other story. But like, but I found really quickly that that's the easiest offering that you can just have up there, just hang up the shingle and it's done. Yep. So, um, okay. So now, uh, I want to talk about kind of like the whole digital makeover scene that seems to be happening with a lot of people, myself included. I know that you did a redesign of Think Traffic. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I know that there are reasons that people do it to just, you know, maybe improve or up-level their business and, you know, refine the in, the vision or refine how your vision is shown to other people. But I, I'd love to know what you think and what advice you give to people who are thinking of rebranding and that's why they want this makeover. They want to make over from the inside out. What is what is some advice you'd give to someone who's thinking about doing that? Well, um, I've helped a number of people go through rebranding, major rebranding exercises like um, we talked earlier before we started recording about Scott Dinsmore with Live Your Legend. Um, he's doing phenomenal with that site now. And uh, before that, his site was called Reading for Your Success. Mm -hmm. And he had been blogging there for a few years, and he was having a good time with it. And and he and I had met, and I had read his stuff, and it's really good stuff that he was writing at Reading for Your Success. But the brand that he'd come up with initially, it was just one of these things where he thought, you know, I want to write about um, books because I I really like reading, and I want to share book reviews and that sort of thing. And it just sort of started organically. But then along the way, you know, the the brand – and what it was capable of doing and his vision for what he wanted to do and what he wanted to do in the world just diverged at some point, you know, mm-hmm. and and he wasn't making as much traction with the brand that he had and it no longer really um, described what he was trying to do with his clients and, and with, the, with, with his movement. So um, we just decided to kind of look at it holistically and say, you know, what is it ideally that you would like to communicate with people? And um, the cool thing about rebranding online especially with a blog, 
is that you can change a lot of things about how you describe your brand, the name, the domain, the logo, the design, all this kind of stuff. And you don't necessarily have to start over. I think a lot of people are afraid that, you know, I've been blogging for a few years on this site and I'm not getting much traction and I'd love to do something different, but I really don't want to throw away everything I've already done, right? Um, and that and that's smart because a lot of times that content is useful and, and it might be especially useful in a different context, right? So with Scott and with other people that I've worked with, you can actually merge the existing blog into a new site, you know? So you can sort of use that as your archives export them and, and import them into the newly branded site and that way you don't lose all of that con- content and you don't have to lose your subscribers and all that kind of stuff. So um, we, we did that with Scott Dinsmore. I helped Sybil Chavis do that with the possibility of today, which is a really great site. Um, and it used to be, uh, it used to be called Alternative, Alternative View and she just wasn't getting a whole lot of traction with that either. Um, so, you know, there, there are a number of reasons to do it, but oftentimes it's just because you know, frankly, you're not that excited about the brand anymore and you're just not making the traction that you had hoped. You've spent, you know, multiple months or years on it and you're not where you'd like to be. So, you know, you kind of need to look in the mirror and have an honest talk with yourself and say, you know, is this just going to go on for three more years or, or, you know, what am I going to, what should I do and what have I learned and what do I know I should be doing? Yeah. Um, you know, so it, it's, it's a hard conversation to have, but sometimes it's important. Yeah. So I guess it, it really just comes down to having that having that kind of talk with yourself, like, is, is my vision, first of all, like, even, is this even connected? Like, what am I, like, what is my ultimate goal here? And is what I'm doing even going towards that goal? And then, um, you know, is this, am I getting any traction? Like, as months go by, like, what are the results here? And, you know, that's, again, you know, I always like to kind of point it right back at myself and be like, That's what I was doing for, that's what I did at the two year mark. I was like, what am I doing? I feel like I was like Scott's clone. Actually, when I was listening to it, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, and you know, so still I got a ton of traffic about Pilates, by the way. I'm like, a lot of my keywords people are still searching for or finding me for that, but I'm not losing it because people still email me about that. So people actually end up, I end up finding that they're teachers looking to build their business, whatever, mm-hmm. you know, so yep. it all kind of still works, you yeah. know, and even if, you know, and I do think it, I, I think leaving that stuff there as part of your archives, it serves another purpose too in, in, um, people who want to follow what you've done, your journey, mm-hmm. they'll be able to see what you did. And yeah. Be like, Oh, this guy started over here, but now he's doing this. I can do this, you know? Yeah. We're all, we're all, um, on a journey we're all evolving or Mm -hmm. hopefully we're evolving if we're if we have goals and we want to reach those we need to grow over time and it's um you know it it, it may be something like uh you know you've been blogging for two years and you don't have any progress and you're not making any sales and and have no revenue that sort of thing or it can be even a more sophisticated business like you said like you know like laura is evolving with with her platform everybody goes through that we're doing that Mm -hmm. with think traffic as well so You know, you just you learn along the way, and um, once you've learned something critical that could really make an impact, then you have to figure out ways to implement that. And a lot of times, that means you know taking the taking the progress that you've made and letting that be part of your foundation, you know, and put it in the past and let it be part of the you know the roots. But part of your um, story. (laughs) Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, So then, you know, you alluded to changes at Think Traffic and like. What was what was the main driver behind your redesign for Think Traffic? Well, um, the design we had was uh, about two years old, and it was something I did myself. And I, you know, I'm a I'm a an okay designer, but I, you know, there's a gap between my abilities as a designer and what I would like to have. So I knew that you know eventually I might want to have a professional do it. But when you start, a lot of times you have to make compromises and decisions about where you want to spend time and money on a project and um, you know for me at the time I decided to do the design at Think Traffic myself but you know now um, after a couple of years I have the the um, luxury of being able to pay someone to do a design for me and um, I just you know I found a really talented person that I, I thought could represent Think Traffic well and also um, you know in our space I, I kind of want to um, position Think Traffic a little bit differently from the other sites that are out there because you know there there is competition in the space that I'm in, we teach people how to grow an audience online. And there are obviously other blogs out there that do that. Copy blogger, pro blogger, 
Um, you know, there are a ton of them out there. And um, looking at Think Traffic, you know, it's very important to make sure that um, if someone is evaluating all the competition that's out there, that yours stands out somehow and, and gives people a reason to take notice, gives them a reason to remember you, has a better story, you know, a different design. There are all kinds of ways you can differentiate. But for me, design was one of those things that where we could say, Think Traffic is different just by looking at it. And then if you dig in and, and read our story and the kinds of stuff that we teach, it's different you know, once you get in there. But a lot of times people are just going to show up and they're going to make a split second decision based on what they see you know, within, within you know, a few seconds of visiting your site. And design is, is a really, really important thing um, to capture someone's attention and sort of set the, the tone of what they should expect on the site. Can I, can I ask you, um, because I'm, I'm curious if it re-sparked any current readers to maybe come maybe like there's part of it like because for me I was like oh and then I like you know I found myself you know you know because there's a lot of shiny objects people get Mm -hmm. you know torn to like different different blogs and whatever but like that kind of refreshed not just you but refresh maybe your readers and like yeah you know you know uh, a blog (laughs) is a blog is a great vehicle um for for writing and communicating and and it's an incredible platform but eventually it becomes sort of a a poor um, a poor vehicle for discovering old content. It's really good at showing you the fresh new content. Mm-hmm. But after two years, we had, uh, I don't know, like a couple of hundred posts in there. And some of them are, are really good, you know, classic sort of posts. And you can, you can represent a few of your best posts on your sidebar or whatever, but there's a whole lot of richness to it. And so as part of this redesign, one of the really important criteria was that we better presented old content, you know, and had different ways for people to dive into that old content. So we came up with, you know, like a, a better sort of start here page, better organization of of the important posts, um, sh- pulling some of that stuff onto the homepage even and having a little links to some of the better posts so that when somebody comes to the site, it's not just dependent on did we happen to write a really great post that connected with that person in the past two days or something. Right. Um, when they come to the site, maybe they see that new post, but what we really want is for them to connect with one of our classic posts that have proven to be um, the kind of thing that gets someone to subscribe and to say, oh, I get it. I understand why this site is important. So we just wanted to display those better. And, um, you know, in the beginning, it doesn't matter so much because you only have, you know, a handful of posts, but after a couple of years, you just have all those archives and they become important. Yeah, um, I've actually thought I... I think that you guys have always, like, even before the redesign, you were doing a good job of that because I definitely found myself looking at the sidebar posts that you had chosen, you know, the popular ones. I was like, oh, where's that? Oh, wait a minute. It's over here. You know, so I think that you kind of already had that probably as like a goal in your mind. But then, you know, you found like in with the new designer a way to really bring that, bring that out because you're right. A lot of the content that you write, you know, last month. To, like a year ago, six months ago, it's gone right. unless you have a way of showing it again. Right, exactly. Okay, so then, so then, back to back to blog relaunch, back to blog launches, and specifically relaunches. What do you think? Um, what do you think the most important question that someone should ask themselves if they are planning? They're like. They're, you know, redesigning, whatever, they're retooling everything. What is one of the most important questions they can ask themselves to kind of, I don't know how to say, start the, the launching process, that relaunching process, but what should they be focusing their attention on, really? So um, so you're not talking about the, the branding or the design or the new no. name or anything. You mean the actual launch sequence? like? Yeah, I guess the launch sequence, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, to me, um, a launch is a is a... A great opportunity, and a lot of times it's it's wasted because as a business um, or as a blog, you don't have that many opportunities to to make a big deal about yourself. You know, like an event or something that that is newsworthy, right? And and the unveiling of a new blog or a new concept that is a newsworthy event in your history, and those don't come about very often. You know, it's like whenever a new product comes out or whenever maybe you hire someone, or like major milestones, those are events. And those are great times to spread the word about what you're doing and get people excited about it. You know, like, like with the Think Traffic redesign, you know, that's a, that's a great time for us to toot our own own horn a little bit. And so, 
um, the worst thing you can do is just sort of throw it up there and, you know, quietly publish something in the night or make a big change in the night and then just put up a blog post and call it good. I think it, it um, for me, whenever a, a product is being developed or a new service or a redesign or anything like that, um, I started thinking about the launch pretty early. Probably, um, probably I do some thinking about it right away, you know, oh, how can I position this? How can we get the word out? Who should we involve? That sort of stuff. Um, and then definitely, you know, as we get, you know, two months or six weeks or, or a month away from the actual launch date, then I literally start planning out on a timeline, you know, what needs to happen when, which content do I need to publish when, um, how can I get on other sites, you know, and have uh, us featured, that sort of thing. And you can kind of work backwards from that and say, you know, oh, if during the launch week, it would be really great to have a couple of guest posts written on these other sites. Well, you need to start working on that six weeks before, and you need to start thinking about who do I have relationships with and who can I get in touch with easily. And if you don't know people, then maybe you need to start working on those relationships. So maybe you need to start working two months before or something like that. So, you know, it's a combination of things, but really a launch is, you know, it's, there's going to be a whole lot of content involved. Like, how are you telling the story about, about this, this new thing that's coming out? Um, who's going to help you tell that story? How are you going to get the existing people who are paying attention to your site excited about it and maybe even on board with a launch? How can you, how could they help you or how, how can you get them involved? Um, so, you know, there's just a whole lot of moving parts and, and it really pays to start planning, um, long before that happens because a, a lot of people work really hard on something and, and, you know, it's like you can pour hours and hours and hours into a project and then if you just like two days before go, oh, crap, how am I going to get the word out? You're really wasting all of that effort. You know, it would be better to spend less time actually on the product probably and a little bit more time on the launch. I mean, I know that, you know, the content and the product is the thing. It's really important. You have to do a good job there. But you could maybe do a really great job on a smaller subset of the overall product that you were thinking about. Just really nail one piece of it. But free up some time so that the, the marketing of it and the spreading the word and getting people excited about it can take a little bit more of your time. Yeah. I definitely think that the plan is a big part of it. It's a big part of what we do at LKR. It's now, it's always been a big part of what I do too. It's like as far in advance as you can. And especially with the relationship aspect of it, that, that could be months, months and months in advance where you might, you know, you might think, you might even want to think about on a six month basis, you know, think about what's going to be happening in the next six months to the year, you know, and because things don't happen overnight. And just because you ask someone to tweet for you, it doesn't mean you're going to get a ton of sales. <laughs> right. <know>? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, I'm a huge, um, fan of the, the plan because there are, there are a ton of moving pieces and the sooner that you know, when those have to be kind of fit in the better mm -hmm. and the more prepared you'd be. And you don't have to create all of your product before you get all those pieces figured out. In fact, it's, it is better to figure out the plan for the launch and then see when you can have the, the content for the product done. I yeah. Think. Yeah. And you know, a great resource that um, helped me with my first launch, because I think, um, you know, there are, it's, it's really helpful to have a checklist and sort of an idea of what needs to go on in a launch. Yeah. And, um, you know, because basically, you know, you need to, um, if this is a product, especially, you need to help people um, understand what the product is about, understand the objections they might have about, you know, whether or not it's for them. And these are things that you might address in a sales letter, um, you know, like if you actually write like a, you know, the sales pitch on, you know, for a product or something. And um, the metaphor that I heard is sort of to take that sales letter and turn it on its side and yeah. lay it out over a timeline, you know, yep. in the days and weeks leading up to the launch. And I think that comes from Jeff Walker from yep. something called Product Launch Formula. Um, but um, there's also a, a little guide by Dave Navarro and Naomi Dunford called yeah. Launch the Blank Out of Your Ebook. Yeah. And um, that's a great little guide on how to do a launch. I think it's a $97 ebook or something. But I bought that and, and followed it um, pretty pretty directly for one of my first launches, and, and it, it uh, really helped me tremendously. Yeah, I find that, that the Dave Navarro one is is pretty applicable to most most product type launches, you know, depending on what it is, he really simplifies it. And he actually just came recently had another ebook on relaunching mm, cool. and, and realizing how to do that. So I really, I really liked his stuff and how he did it and the sideways sales letter as well. I like that yep. um, as well. That's a really good resource. Okay. 
So I know we're not tight, tight on time, but I want to ask you just one of the questions that someone asked sure. to me to ask you. Um, so she, Lauren, uh, a woman in Fearless Launching, she was asking, you know, in, in starting a profitable blog was more unique in years past. And now it's more commonplace. That's what she said. How, how has that changed or impacted a person's ability to monetize an actual blog now? Do you think that there's a difference? Meaning, meaning like um, maybe she's talking a little bit about competition. Like there's a lot of it's, – it's just sort of common for people to try to start a blog yeah. and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't think it's, it's necessarily, I mean, maybe it's a little bit harder to create a monster blog, like to create a Zen habits these days. It might be a little bit harder to do that than it was. Um, but you know, we do see examples of people who are doing that. Um, Steve Cam with nerd fitness. He has, mm -hmm. I just saw him tweet the other day that he has a million page views a month, um, <laughs> between his blog and his forums and things. So he's doing a great job. Benny Lewis, um, at, at, um, the, he does the language hacking guides, uh, fluent in three months. Uh, Benny's doing a great job. Chris Gillibo obviously has done a great job in the past four years. Um, so, you know, I think that there are all kinds of opportunities out there. Now, in terms of monetizing a blog, though, you really, I, this is something that you really have to get straight in your mind is that a blog is not a business, right? And maybe people have heard this before. Yeah. A blog is not a business. It's simply a, plat a communications platform and a way to connect with people, um, to demonstrate your value and to communicate with them, but a blog doesn't make money on its own. So your business has to be in the business of providing some particular value that people are willing to pay money for, and that the form of that value is going to take, um, you know, it's going to be either an information product like an ebook, a series of videos, a course, maybe a live coaching session, group coaching, um, services that you provide to someone, something that you package up and offer for sale. A blog is, is really just a place that you can tell them about that sale. You can tell them about what you're working on. You can you know, give them little um, teasers about it. You can demonstrate that value in smaller formats. Um, so you really have to get that straight. Um, I think, honestly, for people who are really driven and, and focused, it's a little bit easier now in some ways because there's so many great tools out there and so many great services that you can use to create your first product. You know, it's, it's far easier to create video, web video these days and right. to do these kinds of interviews and things like that than it was even just a few years ago. So um, the technology makes it easier. The trick is really to um, find a topic that you can carve out a specific little um, niche in and, and do something exciting that other people aren't necessarily doing. Um, because there is a lot of competition out there, so you have to make sure that your offering is well differentiated. You know that that if if someone is evaluating everybody in your space, that you have a unique story to tell and a reason for them to choose your business over another business. Well said. Well said. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, okay, so the absolute last question I have for you today is. Um, Actually, you know, I feel like you've you've kind of given this, so maybe you want to hammer it home one more time. But like, what what advice do you give for someone who's launching for the very first time? Like, what what's one thing you'd say to someone if they came? You'd be like, I don't know if I should launch. What should I do? Well, um, there's a couple of things. So uh, it kind of depends on if you're talking about a, a blog or a product. Um, like I said earlier, uh, especially with products, you can talk yourself out of it over and over and over again. You can, you know, come up with ideas, you know, you can have like 20 ideas and you can say, oh, I think I'm going to try this one. No, that one's bad because of yeah. X, Y, and Z. I'm going to try this one. No, wait, you know, and, and then you think, wait, why did I decide not to do that one? And you kind of go back and forth a lot, right? And, and there's just this mental game that you're playing with yourself. And really that mental game, a lot of it is due just to fear, the fear of like launching something and nobody showing up, right? That's and what it is. <laughs> right. It's, it's, there is a big fear there. And, and I have that fear every time that I come up with something new. And um, over time, you realize that, you know what, you actually never really know how something's going to turn out until you do it. You might have an idea. And after you've gone through it a few times, you can kind of get better at knowing what's going to stick and what isn't. But in the beginning, you kind of have no idea. You know, like like Brett Kelly, who we mentioned earlier, he sold 15,000 copies of that Evernote Essentials. And it, it today, it still blows his mind. And he had no clue. I mean, I think he probably thought, Hey, it'd be great if I sold 10 copies of this and made dollars or something. And meanwhile, he has like a multiple six-figure business that's that's really, really simple. So you never could predict that. And um, I think you just have to realize, you know, out of all of these possibilities, if you have 20 different ideas, 
narrow it down to the top five. You can probably figure out which the top five are. And then from there, you kind of just have to throw a dart, you know, throw a, throw a dart. And, and I'd say the best plan would be to say, take those five and commit to actually launching all of them over the course of 18 months. Say, you know what? Every three months, I'm going to launch a new one because you know that if you get all six out there, one of them is going to do well and right. a couple of them might not do anything at all. Um, but that, you know, that's, that's how some people have built up really incredible businesses like Chris Gillibo, right? For example, mm -hmm. he has like, I don't know, seven or eight different products out there. <laughs> and um, for a couple of years, he was just like an unstoppable product launch machine. He just came out with new stuff every three <laughs> years. Six months. And uh, meanwhile, most people just sat there twiddling their thumbs, you know, evaluating their opportunities when if they had just, you know, put their head down and done the work, eventually in aggregate, you would get the results you were looking for. So, you know, I guess the bottom line is stop looking for the home run. Stop thinking that, you know, you have to come up with this perfect idea and you get one chance and it's going to be like make or break your entire life. Instead of that, just, you know, try to hit a bunch of doubles and, and singles to use baseball terminology. <laughs> and things will add up to, to, to winning the game. Great. Yeah. I, that's, I love that advice. It's perfect for, for fearless launching. And, um, so I'm going to ask you to tell everybody how they can get in touch with you, see what you're about. I know we talked about think traffic, um, but, um, anything else you want to share with people that's coming up? Um, if someone is in the position of having a, a, you know, an online presence or if they want one and they want to build an audience online, then thinktraffic.net is probably the best place to go because we have um, hundreds of free articles about how to grow an audience online. If um, someone is interested a little bit more in like the lifestyle aspects that we were talking about earlier and um, you know, just these big questions that people have about career and um, life and how they integrate and what's possible and working remotely and being location independent, all that kind of stuff. Um, check out my site at corbettbar.com. And, um, I have, I've been writing there for three and a half years and you can kind of follow my journey about, you know, when I, the sabbatical we took and how I started this business and how it, it evolved into what it is today. And if you want to learn more about blog, launching a new blog, relaunching a blog, really refining your blog, Definitely check out Start a Blog That Matters, um, which is a really a phenomenal course. It's just it's it's so full, it's so rich, and I highly recommend it. Thank you. Yeah, we've had uh, I think about eleven hundred people go through that course. Oh my God, that's so great. Uh, we just get rave reviews from it, and and um, I think it's you know worth many times over the price tag. It just saves you a ton of time and effort in the beginning, and you can learn a lot and sort of get get a leg up. You know, it might take you on your own a year or 18 months to learn all that stuff. And we just tried to pack in everything that we know about getting a blog off the ground in the, in the first couple of months into one little course. Yeah, it's a, it's a great course. So, so, uh, I thank you for that too. Um, okay. So Corbett, I'm going to break us off here. Cause I know you, you've got to go, I've got to go. We're busy, busy, busy. Um, but thank you so much again for coming today. And, uh, Hope to see you around. We'll Thanks. chat more soon. I want to talk about. I wanted to talk about another launch, but it, it's just as get it's get, it would go on for hours. We can't have a marathon. <laughs> Let's do it again. And this was um, pretty painless, I think. Right? I think you, so. You did a great job. <laughs> you didn't. You didn't poke any fun at me though. So so I'm like I was waiting for it the whole time. <laughs> nope. Yeah, you were doing such a good job. There was nothing to poke fun at. Thanks oh, for having. Very sweet. Very sweet. Okay, Corbett. Thank you very much. Talk okay. Soon. Talk to you soon.